We're live. Okay, sergeants, will you start your recordings? You see recording on the way. Thank you. And Ms. Jones, when you're ready, you may begin. Okay. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their videos? And to minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you so much for your cooperation. And Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much. Rubbing alcohol. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining today's virtual committee on women and gender equity hearing on resolutions 923, asking the governor to repeal PL240.37, and resolution 1444 to seal the convictions from PL240.37. I'm Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I want to start by thanking everyone who has come out to testify today. Those with lived experiences in particular are the voices that we want to hear. Last year at the committee's November hearing on gender equity in New York City, access resources and support for transgender and gender nonconforming New Yorkers, we heard powerful testimony in support of Resolution 923. In 2020, we have seen at least 40 transgender or gender nonconforming people fatally shot or killed, the majority of whom are women and, uh, and in particular trans women of color. Violence against trans people comes in so many forms. We see it play out in daily interactions on the street, in the workplace, in city institutions, thinking now of the shameless murder of Laylene Polanco. And it even plays out by the media outlets, further perpetuating a system of violence that criminalizes TGNC folks. We're here today to discuss just one of these forms of violence. Trans women in New York City have been targeted for over four decades because of Penal Law 240.37, a law enacted in 1976, which criminalizes people for loitering for the purpose of engaging in a prostitution offense. In reality, this statute, known widely as walking while trans ban, allows women to be arrested for the clothes they are wearing or for being in a certain location for a certain period of time. Charges from this law, however unfounded, have reverberating implications for employment, housing, immigration status, and parental rights. Let's be clear, this law is racist, plain and simple. It's disproportionately enforced to criminalize cis and trans women, runaway and homeless LGBTQ plus youth and immigrants. According to the Legal Aid Society of New York, arrests under this law disproportionately target black and Latino women. Aside from the statistics that we read, the stories that we have heard and will hear today, one thing is clear. Section 240.37 must be repealed. I want to thank my colleague, Council Member Carlina Rivera for sponsoring the two important pieces of legislation that our committee is hearing today. Resolution 
923 repealing PL 240.37 and resolution 1444 to seal the convictions from PL 240.37. I am proud to be a sponsor of both pieces of legislation and I am proud and humbled to be an ally. I wanna thank all the advocates for their tireless work on this issue. We thank you for sharing your lived experiences and shaping the work that we do here at the City Council. Finally, I'd like to thank my team, my Chief of Staff, Cindy Cardinal, my Legislative Director, Madhuri Shukla, as well as committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, Legislative Counsel, Chloe Rivera, Senior Legislative Policy Analyst, Monica Peppel, Financial Analyst, and Elizabeth Arts from Community Engagement, and John Blasco, the City Council's LGBTQ plus liaison. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues who have joined us. Councilmember Rivera, Councilmember Ayala, Councilmember Lander, and the newly minted Councilmember Diaz. Um, and I want to pass it over now to Councilmember Rivera to give her opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much to everyone. Uh, thank you, Chair Rosenthal, for holding this hearing on my two resolutions related to the repeal of New York State Penal Law Section 240.37, commonly known as the walking while trans ban. Over a year ago, I introduced legislation calling on state lawmakers to repeal this section of the New York Penal Law Section. And advocates and individuals are all here to say it's time to ban this harmful statute. In the time since then, we've lost over 50 members of our trans community. It's unacceptable that we lost these beloved souls. And it's unacceptable that countless more trans New Yorkers are still targeted by the broad and vague walking while trans ban, which for years has been used by police officers to arbitrarily single out and arrest people suspected of prostitution and has specifically been used to target members of our Black and Latino trans community. The majority of arrests under the statute in New York State occur in just five New York City police precincts, all predominantly Black and Brown, immigrant, and low-income neighborhoods. And countless trans advocates have shared stories of being stopped by the police simply because they were out with their friends or their partner in their own neighborhood. The women and others arrested under this law face devastating permanent consequences for their arrests. A single violation under this law could follow someone for the rest of their lives, as this is one of only two violations in the entire state penal code that can never be sealed. That unsealed violation could haunt and follow these individuals forever leading to denials for things like green cards, public housing, employment, or other benefits we consider human rights, many of which can be life-saving. It is unacceptable that in our city and our state, after the year we've had reflecting on systemic racism, that New York State still permits police to target New Yorkers solely for their gender expression and, frankly, their existence. Holding this hearing today will draw an important focus to victim stories, to survivor stories, and will hopefully be the start of our new push to get legislation sponsored by State Senator Brad Hoyleman and Assemblymember Amy Pollan passed in this legislative session. Thank you again, Chair Rosenthal, and thank you to all of the activists, the advocates, and the Walking While Trans Ban Coalition who have fought for this legislation as well as GMHC, Make the Road, and the Legal Aid Society who have been in this movement every step of the way. Thank you so much for the time. I look forward to the hearing. Appreciate you, Councilmember Rivera. Um, really appreciate all of your hard work on this. Now I'll turn it over to Senior Policy Analyst, Chloe Rivera, who will review some procedural items related to today's hearing and we'll call the first panel of witnesses.
Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. My name is Chloe Rivera, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling panelists to testify. Before we begin, please remember that everyone will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you are called on, you will be, you will be unmuted by the host. Note that there will be a few seconds delay before you're unmuted and we can hear you. For public testimony, I will call in up individuals and panels. Please listen for your name. I will periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. We will now turn to public testimony. The first panel in order of speaking will be T.S. Candy, a TGNC advocate, Miane Garcia, LGBTQ justice organizer at, the Make, at Make the Road New York, Jared Trujillo, president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys, and Brian Romero, policy associate at GMHC. I will now call on T.S. Candy. Your time starts now. My name is T.S. Candy. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I'm the executive director of Black Trans Nation. Repealing the walking while trans ban means a lot to the black and brown transgender community. A lot of the black and brown transgender community has been stopped in frizz for simply walking down the street. It is really, really important that we understand the humanity of the, the life experience of transgender women who is just simply walking down the street and not engaging or looking for anything other than going to the store and buying something to eat. It is really important that we conceal, um, 1444, we conceal the um, prostitution and the loading for the person, uh, the loading for the purpose of prostitution um, we should we should still it so that individuals like myself could get a chance to be able to learn how to live. Um, due to prostitution being openly on my record, it has it had gave me a, it has been the biggest hiccup in my life. It has prevented me from jobs. It has prevented me from housing. It has basically destroyed my humanity as being a black transgender woman for simply existing because. This, because of an officer profiling me because of an Adam's apple or because of my hands too big or because of my, they seek masculinity. And it has always been um, something on my record that made me more vulnerable to do what was put, placed on my record. So it's very, very important for us to repeal this law so that we as black transgender women can be able to reclaim our existence and our humanity and so that we can get employment and so that we can get housing and then so that we can be able to live. Um, I yield back my time. Thank you for your testimony. Now, Ms. Garcia, you may begin once a member of our staff unmutes you and the sergeant gives you the cue. John starts now. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Vene Garcia. Soy organizadora del Comité de Trans Immigrant Project de la organización Make the Road New York. Estoy aquí para compartir mi testimonio de cómo una madrugada en el 2008, cuando yo tenía 18 años, era la segunda vez que me vestía de mujer y salía a divertirme con mi novio. Fui parada y requisada por oficiales encubiertos en la esquina de la 86 y Roosevelt Avenue. Era pasado las 4 de la mañana cuando mi pareja y yo caminábamos por Roosevelt Avenue agarrados de la mano, cuando de pronto oficiales encubiertos se bajaron de una van y me empujaron frente a la pared. Sin tener mi consentimiento, los oficiales quitaron mi bolso y tiraron todo al piso. 
Ellos encontraron condones y esa fue la evidencia para acusarme de sexo servicio. Aunque mi novio y yo tratamos de explicar que éramos pareja, la policía no nos creyó e intimidó a mi pareja con arrestarlo si, nos, si no nos íbamos de la escena. Empecé mi transición a la edad de 17 años junto a otras dos amigas trans también indocumentadas. Ellas ya no están en este país porque fueron perfiladas como trabajadoras sexuales y fueron arrestadas y después deportadas a sus países de orígenes. El querer expresar nuestro género e y, o vestirse sexy es para la policía una forma de perfilarlos como trabajadoras sexuales. Nueva York debe hacer más para proteger a las comunidades transgéneros, género no conforme y no binario. Muchas tenemos miedo de salir a la tienda, a la esquina o a, o a salir a caminar con nuestras parejas por el temor de violencia eh, policíaca y el perfilamiento. Conozco historia de mujeres trans que han tenido que llevar el certificado de matrimonio por miedo a ser perfiladas como trabajadoras sexuales. Pido que la ciudad de Nueva York pase la, la resolución 0923 para que se revoque el código penal 24037, deambular con el propósito de prostitución, porque la policía lo usa para, lo usa para um, justificar sus paradas y requisadas ilegales contra las personas transgénero como yo. El problema con este código es que es demasiado amplio y le da libertad a los policías de detenernos en cualquier momento sin reconocer el impacto migratorio que puede tener. Um, estos arrestos injustificados tienen muchos problemas a mis hermanas trans en el momento de querer realegar su estatus migratorio o en muchas ocasiones terminan encarceladas, que también han um, deportadas. Por lo tanto, demando que la ciudad de Nueva York se comprometa a presionar al Estado para derrogar el Código Penal 24037, lo cual es una problemática de stop and frisk contra nuestra identidad de género y va contra los valores y el apoyo de la ciudad um, comprometido a darle la, la comunidad inmigrante. Muchas gracias por su tiempo. Thank you for your testimony. Next. I'm sorry. Next, we will have President Trujillo. Your time starts now. Hi all. Hi all. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jared Trujillo. I am the president of the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys. Uh, first, I want to just thank uh, Council Member uh, Rosenthal uh, for calling this meeting and Council Member Rivera uh, for really having the leadership uh, to, to really push uh, to push these two resolutions and both and so many of the other uh, members of the council that are on this call uh, for just being true allies and for recognizing the humanity of the communities that are really impacted by both of these resolutions. Um, a lot of, just to talk about the statutes, uh, 240.37, uh, this is a statute that is constitutionally dubious at best. It was passed in 1976. And when this law was passed, over 9,700 people per year were stopped and targeted and arrested under the statute simply for having the audacity to exist in, in, in public spaces while wearing a tight skirt, while, we, uh, while hailing a cab, while waiting for a friend, while, again, just having this simple audacity to exist. When we think about, when we talk about how so much of the criminal legal system is a remnant of the Jim Crow era laws, this is what we're talking about. This law is a direct descendant of the Jim Crow vagrancy laws where people were simply punished for being on the street. That is what the statute is. I, I wanna talk uh, about uh, Council Member Rivera's uh, resolution 1444 um, and why it's so important. 1444 uh, calls for the state uh, to pass provisions that would seal old violations under this statute. Um, as the council member said, this is one of only two violations in the, in the entire penal code that never seals. A violation is less than a criminal disposition. A, a violation is supposed to be a non-criminal uh, a, a non infraction. However, because this never seals, it can be used for someone's entire life uh, to deny them employment, to deny them housing, to deny them, to deny people, uh, specifically black and brown trans and, and uh, gender uh, non-conforming folks that already face a lot of barriers, it could really use, be used to deprive people of what they need to survive. 
I also want to uplift intro 1314, even though it's not uh, the, uh, even though it's not the subject of uh, today's testimony, at the same time, if the city council were to pass that bill, um, it would um, prevent employers from even inquiring about unsealed violations, uh, which of course, uh, lording for the pur purpose of prostitution is one of those. And also thank uh, council member uh, Rosenthal for being the newest person to sign on to that bill and uh, council member Lander for introducing it. Um, and, and finally, I only have a few seconds left. Seattle has repealed their walking while trans statute. New York should be a leader. New York should stand up for our black and brown communities. If black and brown trans lives matter, this is how we show it. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Romero? Your time starts now. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chairperson Rosenthal, Councilwoman Rivera, and the members of the New York City Council's Women and Gender Equity Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brian Romero, I use he and his, and I'm a policy associate at GMHC. I testify today in support of resolution 0923, which supports passage of legislation in the New York State Senate and Assembly to repeal penal law 240.37, loitering for the purpose of engaging in prostitution. Since the inception of this statute, it has resulted in the profiling, harassment, and incarceration of thousands of women, particularly trans women of color. It remains as many other community members have come to know it as, a stop and frisk 2.0 for black and brown women. Data shows that 90% of women who are arrested under this statute are women of color, illustrating how this is a racial justice and gender equity issue. Accounts from the community have also demonstrated how criminalization under the statute has caused barriers to housing, employment, accessing benefits, all of which are necessary, particularly during this time. The support for repealing the statute has been overwhelming. Governor Cuomo, Lieutenant Governor Hochul, 37 state senators, 80 assembly members, five district attorneys, and 30 council members are in support of this bill finally passing. Racial justice, women rights groups, immigrant rights groups, and criminal justice groups all want this to pass. However, in order to have the maximum, maximum impact for those who have been impacted by the statute, we must also ensure that New York State seals violations related to 240.37. As long as this is in penal law and on someone's record, it will continue to threaten the quality of life for people who simply want to survive and be treated equitably in our city and state. If our elected leaders truly believe that Black lives matter and Black trans lives matter, and if they're truly committed to reversing the harms that discriminatory policing has had, then we must seal these violations once and for all. That is why we support passage of resolution 144. Finally, as many advocates have said, this statute criminalizes them for being who they are and dressing as they choose. As a cis man, I have not experienced this reality, but it was trans Latina women who have very graciously and generously helped me become more comfortable in my skin as a young queer man of color, even as they experience discrimination every single day. Today, I testify for Issa, Nisa, Valerie, and the many women who have given so much for us to simply be, and so that one day as a society, we could truly see them. I urge the city and state to do just that. See these women, repeal the walking while trans ban, and seal the violations once and for all. Thank you. You know, I, I just have to start by thanking this panel for your leadership. Um, T.S. Candy, uh, Biane, you've been in this fight forever. Um, and your courage and leadership is phenomenal. Brian, as usual, you've knocked it out of the ballpark. You fight so hard for the LGBTQ plus community. I am grateful for you. And Jared, taking on these cases and your leadership with the legal aid um, attorneys is um, it, one can hear your passion in how you talk about this in such a wise way. I wanna thank you for 
um, your perseverance on this. Um, let's see, I see. Yeah, Rosenthal? Yeah. Before we move to council member questions, we have another panelist available to translate for. Oh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I believe uh, Mateo Tabaras, um, if you yeah. are available, uh, the sergeant will uh, start the clock for translation in a moment. Thank you. Thank you, Mateo. Hi, good morning. My name is Mateo Guerrero, and I'm going to interpret for BNA. Um, so she said, good morning, everyone. My name is Vianney Garcia. I'm a community organizer with the Transmigrant Project at Mechtero, New York. I am here to share my testimony on how morning, uh, one of the mornings in 2008, while I was 18 years old, um, and the second time that I was dressing as a woman, I decided to go out and have fun with my boyfriend, uh, but I was stopped and frisked by undercover police officers in the corner of 86th Street and Roosevelt Avenue. It was past 4 a.m. in the morning when my partner and I were walking on Roosevelt Avenue. We were holding hands when all of a sudden undercover um, cops got off a van and pushed me in front of the wall. And without my consent, the officers took my bag and threw everything to the floor. They found condoms and that was enough evidence for them to accuse me of doing sex work. Although my boyfriend and I tried to explain that we were a couple uh, there we were a couple. The police didn't believe me and intimidated my partner with arresting him if he didn't leave the scene. I began my transition at the age of 17 with two other transgender undocumented friends, and they no longer are in this country because they were profiled as sex workers and were arrested and then deported to the country of origin. Um, wanting to express our gender or dressing sexy is enough for the police to profile ourselves as sex workers. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, wanting to express our gender or dress sexy is not enough for the police officers. To, it's enough for the police to profile us as sex workers. New York, New York must do more to protect transgender and gender non-conforming and non-binary communities. Many of us are afraid to go to the corner store, uh, go out to dinner, or work uh, walk with our partners um, out in public because of police misconduct and profiling. I know stories of other transgender women who have to carry their marriage certificate out of fears of being profiled as sex workers and being arrested. I demand that New York City passes resolution 0923 to repeal the penal code 24037 loitering with the intents of prostitution because the police use it to justify their illegal stops and frisk practices against transgender people like myself. The problem with this penal code is that it's too broad and gives the police the freedom to stop at any time without recognizing the immigration impact it can have on many of us. These unjustified arrests bring many problems to transgender sisters when they want to fix their immigration status because they often end up in prisons and then deported. Therefore, I demand that the city of New York commits itself to pressuring the state to repeal the penal code 24037. This is a problem of stop and frisk against our gender identity and it goes against the values that the city has committed to to provide support to immigrant communities. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Mateo. Um, very powerful words. I also want to acknowledge we've been joined by council member Gibson and I do see New York State Assemblywoman Pollen here. I just want to acknowledge you. I know you'll speak later, but thank you for being here and um, thank you for showing us your dog, which brings some joy to 2020. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Councilmember Rivera, please. Time starts now. Thank you so much to, to all of the panelists uh, for sharing your stories. I guess I'll start with uh, Mr. Trujillo. Just a couple questions. Um, can you tell us more about how police today use this law to target your clients, what are the experiences when they are arrested and how have they reported being treated by police while in custody? Um, so I'll say that uh, I, I don't practice in court anymore and, and people like Jill and so many other folks here uh, do still do that and Melissa, so many other people do do that work. Uh, but what I'll say just broadly, the, police, the, office, the words of police officers themselves, uh, in a 2016 legal aid lawsuit, an officer admitted that when he was determining who to target under the statute, he looked for women with Adam's apples. 
uh, we know that sexual, uh, sexual assault and sexual abuse is a second most common form of police misconduct. And almost no one, maybe no one experiences that more. Uh, than sex workers and people that are profiled as sex workers. Uh, you know, there's just so many instances and stories of people that are targeted by the statute also talking, you know, saying that uh, they've been sexually harassed, they've been sexually abused, uh, they've been threatened. Uh, just just uh, so many instances of police really weaponizing uh, the statute uh, to deprive people of their humanity and to make people feel unsafe. I, this, this brings to mind I had, um a trans woman arrested in my district, uh, referred in the news as Nikki Stone. Uh, they were arrested in an unmarked van at a BLM protest uh, this summer. I'm just curious as to what other areas do we need to tackle when it comes to police harassment and treatment of trans New Yorkers, particularly trans New Yorkers of color. And I guess I would also ask um, for any of the panelists, especially uh, T.S. Candy, you mentioned your, your experience, if you can elaborate on your experience with the police and how this statute has affected you. I realize they're kind of two separate questions, but one is just how your experience, how the statute has affected you personally. Um, I realize this is a very, very personal and, and, and sensitive story and experience that you would be sharing. And then considering all that we've seen, especially over the past few months, especially with interactions as this movement in New York over racial injustice that we've really been forced to reckon with the other areas we need to tackle when it comes to police harassment and treatment of trans New Yorkers, particularly trans New Yorkers of color. Okay, great. Um, well, I will reiterate uh, my story for those who um, are new here and that um, never heard my story before. Um, I was I was homeless. I was living in a shelter and I was in the Bronx and I was coming outside um, because this, the homeless shelter was a non-smoking facility and I was coming outside to, um, to smoke a cigarette and um, a vehicle wrote down, mind you, I Never, I um, went on a tour to actually come up here to move, well, to move to New York. I'm, I'm originally from the South. And um, so an unmarked vehicle come out. It was just, it was a, 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 a like a dark blue vehicle. Um, and it was two guys in the front, two men in the front. And um, they had basically saw me, um, I was walking out the, the gate and I was standing like right there by the, the stop sign by the walkway. And I was just smoking a cigarette and, you know, on the phone. And the officer told me basically to come here. And he told me, um, uh, he basically told me that he was gonna arrest me for the loitering for the purpose of prostitution if I wasn't going to be an informant. So therefore he was like, um, I need to locate um, guns and drugs. Um, and I told him he was, they was gonna give me $1,500 for, for, uh, for guns and drugs. And I didn't know, and I wasn't gonna put my life on the line for that. And, um, and so he gave me another option. He was like, so, or, or you have to give us oral sex. So um, they drove me around and they drove me around. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I gave the oral sex uh, to both officers. Um, and then when they let me go, um, I hate to say it like this, but I was excited that I was able to cross the, the crosswalk without being um, entrapped or without being arrested. So to answer your question, defunding the police is the number one thing that will help um, remove the police from um, vulnerable communities and the black communities, um, the, uh, regentrifying the areas. So a lot of the police is um, especially vice, they roam in the areas where known um, black trans individuals and Latino trans yes, individuals, they, they know our areas. So therefore, they um, due to quotas and things of that nature that they have to they have to meet due to the state law regulations that's put in place for them. They target us, and they know that New York is a one sided state. So therefore, they, the, whatever they put on the citation or on the report, the uh, the judge is going to side with the police. And us uh, black transgender women doesn't have an, uh, do not have a voice. So it is really important for us to defund the police and to keep police out of the black the the black um, 
the black underfunded, most marginalized neighborhoods. We don't need policing in our neighborhoods. We need you all to invest money into community. We need more counselors. We need more teachers. We don't need police in our areas. So removing the police from historical areas that are known for black and brown transgender individuals to, to be at is the number one thing that we need to do. And we also need to defund the police. So removing the police, keeping the police away from us and out of our areas and Th that's most important to us is removing the police because the police does not help the police incriminate the police the, the state sexual state sanctioned violence is real and we need you all to understand that the police get away with murder as we can see Brianna Taylor I yield back um, just real quickly, we've been joined by council member Kalos and then council member Rivera they're they're Please keep going, um, sergeants. Uh, we we can extend the time for Councilmember Rivera if you have more questions. Hi, I just wanted to, to thank the panel and and you know when I mention other areas that we need to tackle when it comes to police, I do think you know unmarked vehicles, the, the just the way that protests were mishandled, how people are treated that have been historically marginalized. I hope that. We as a council and our colleagues in, in the state and in Washington um, can really deliver for so many people that have had these experiences. And I'm, and I'm sorry and I'm thankful. I'm thankful to be in this space with you. And, and th those are my questions, Chair Rosendahl. I appreciate you um, allowing me to have more time. Councilwoman, if I, if I may, I think. Please. Of course. You know, saying that um, this coalition and, and the DQ New York coalition has also been uh, intentional about uh, pushing amongst our uh, council members is the need to defund the vice squad. Um, it is an incredibly corrupt part of the NYPD. And while I echo, um, I certainly do echo T.S. Candy's um, push to defund the NYPD, a bloated budget that only results in the criminalization of black and brown lives. Um, we know that the that the vice squad in particular has led to the death of Yang Song um, in Queens. And so it's an incredibly violent squad. It doesn't uh, promote safety for anyone. Um, so in addition to what has been said, I would just um, insert here that the vice squad should be eliminated altogether. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. I actually just um, leave a quick question um, for Jared, you mentioned that uh, San Francisco repealed their um, walking while trans ban. Have any other localities uh, done any good work in this area? Yeah, uh, Seattle did uh, recently, uh, just this year. Uh, this year's been very long. I believe it was this year. Um, and a few other, uh, a few other uh, places are, are, are working on it. Uh, I knew New Orleans is doing a lot of work on it. Um, DC is just doing a lot of work in general um, on uh, sex worker liberation and, and people that are profiled as such. Um, and the thing I, I do just want to uplift about uh, Seattle is that when they did it, they, they a lot of the discourse here um, in New York around uh, repealing the walking while trans ban is that not everyone who's profiled by it is a sex worker which is accurate and which is something that we should care about. In Seattle, they did it because of that, but also because of how sex workers are treated. Under 24037 currently, um, it's terrible for anyone who stopped under it, but there are certain bump ups if you do have uh, past uh, prior convictions uh, for any of the, under any of the other prostitution uh, statutes. And it just, it, it complicates people's lives further and it makes those collateral consequences even more dire. Um, so I, I truly do hope that New York can, you know, be a leader, uh, not just for the people that are not sex workers that are profiled under the statute, which is a lot of people, but also the people that are sex workers. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer 100% of the time. Um, I don't want people asking me like legal questions if I'm just like hanging out at brunch sometimes. Uh, you know, if you are a sex worker that just, it, that's not working at the time and you're just hanging out 
uh, walking with your boyfriend or walking to the laundromat, you shouldn't be profiled for this either. Yeah. Um, and could you talk a little bit more uh, from the legal perspective and I really appreciated T.S. Candy's uh, um, sharing her story, but um, from a legal perspective, the consequences of convictions and um, you know violations getting a violation um, under 240.37? Sure. Um, so because this is, even though this isn't a prostitution related offense, uh, it, it's under the, the loitering uh, portion of the penal law, all the, the prostitution codes start with 230, the loitering starts with 240, this is 240.37. Um, because it has prostitution attached to it, the title of it, it's still considered a crime involving uh, moral turpitude, uh, which means that it could complicate someone's ability to adjust their immigration status, uh, to stay in the only country that they've ever called home, um, to even make someone deportable. Um, in addition to that, uh, even just as a violation, which again, isn't even a criminal offense, um, it, it could be used employers can inquire about it. Uh, and a lot of people that have uh, that have these violations want to do things like be home health aides. Well, this is used and this is frequently used to deny someone the opportunity to do that job and just a whole bunch of other of other jobs because employers are allowed to inquire about it in the first place um, until 1314 passes, hopefully soon. Um, and then also discriminate against people. Uh, based upon uh, based upon these violations. Thank you. Um, actually, a few more. Um, do you have? Um, actually, uh, sorry, I'll come back to you in a second, Jared. Um, perhaps this is for Brian, um, but any of the coalition members here, and I'll I'll give others a chance to answer this question on future panels, but um, does anyone have any statistics around um, where the arrests under the loitering law um, or public law 240.37 are happening? Council member Rivera uh, alert, alluded to, to, the, to the zip codes or the precincts where most of this is happening. Um, but Brian, if you could just talk a little bit more about data or um, the demographics or anything like that. Sure, so we mostly see this in, um, in Queens and Jackson Heights, uh, particularly in the Roosevelt Ave area, um, in East New York, um, I believe even the South Bronx, but definitely two zip codes in, in Brooklyn. Um, but the far, like it is by far seen most in the Jackson Heights area of Queens for sure. Um, and earlier in the press, uh, presser, uh, we had um, assembly member elect uh, Gonzalez Rojas speak and it has been part of that district as well in terms of assembly district, but mostly um, in the areas of uh, actually where councilman Danny Drum is um, would have been great um, to have had him on the presser, but he understands this issue well and, and actually, and it's it's very public, he's spoken about this, but Councilman John himself has been um, arrested under this statute. Um, yeah, his lived experience and his passion um, has been a driving force on this council for the past 11 years. He's been an extraordinary leader, so I appreciate your mentioning him, Brian. Um, I, I have a, one more question for Jerry and then Jared, and then, um, Chloe, I know you want me to come back to you, but, um, just to keep the flow for this one second, uh, Jared, as a lawyer, um, uh, it is our understanding and can you help us, uh, clarify this for the record? Is it the case that all five district attorneys in New York City have said they will decline to prosecute arrests for loitering um, for the purposes of prostitution? And how long has that been the case? Well, it's certainly not the case for all five. Um, there oh. are district attorneys, but uh, that doesn't include Staten Island. Uh, Madeline Singus uh, in, in Nassau County has uh, has stopped prosecuting, but there's not a lot of arrests that happen in Staten Island. Um, so I, I I believe so. Brooklyn, I believe, was last year. 
Um, Queens was also pretty recently as well. Um, I don't know if the, the 2020 has been a weird year because people aren't really walking. So it's hard to, you know, and not a lot of people are arrested under the statute because no one's been outside for the long part of the year. Uh, the arrests are certainly down this year, uh, but um, Queens said that they would and the Bronx said that they would as well. Uh, however, something that they did in San Francisco, that uh, Chesa Boudin did in Sa uh, San Francisco, is he also declined to arrest people that are, to prosecute people that were arrested under the pretext of this statute. Um, pretext meaning, you know, like really just a legal excuse uh, to put someone in handcuffs and throw them into a cage. And it would be great if the district attorneys in, um, in New York City would do that as well. Um, you know, of course, we don't want anyone prosecuted under the statute, but we also don't want like someone picked up under the statute and then prosecuted for like having a little bit of weed or for what other, whatever other uh, thing that you know, NYPD wants to incarcerate someone for. Uh, you did not mention the Manhattan DA? Yeah, uh, Manhattan hasn't prosecuted these for a while. I, I don't know the year, but it's been a while. Okay, great. Um, but can I just get for the record, do you happen to know the reasons why um, Laylene Polanco's case was not prosecuted? Uh, so Laylene's case, actually, it wasn't under the statute. It was under a different statute, under 230. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, so, so she wasn't prosecuted because she was going through the human trafficking. I don't know why DOC wasn't prosecuted. Oh, why DOC wasn't prosecuted? Uh -huh. um, yeah. So Daisha could probably speak to this and, and the folks at AVP could speak to this better than I could. Okay. Okay. Fair. Thank you. Sorry. Just on a roll. Uh, um, if I, I'll pass it back now to Chloe Rivera. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I will now call on council members with questions in the order that they have raised their hands in using the raise hand function in Zoom. I also just want to note that panelists' hands will be lowered as they are called via panels. Uh, council members, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the raise hand function in Zoom, please do so now. Also, please remember to keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will maintain a, cl a clock and a member of our staff will unmute you. You may begin after I call on you and the sergeant gives you the cue. We will now hear questions from Councilmember Lander and Councilmember Kalos. Uh, Councilmember Lander. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you so much, Chloe. And I just wanna start with thank yous. Uh, Chair Rosenthal, really grateful to you for convening this hearing and Councilmember Rivera for your leading on this issue in the city and fighting, uh, organizing us to fight at the, at the state level. And of course, especially um, to T.S. Candy um, and to Ms. Rivera and to everyone who's going to testify, uh, excuse me, to Ms. Garcia, to everyone who's going to testify today, like the courage you show, it, like it, it, it makes the hearing powerful in a way that just goes beyond the value even of the resolution and the fight. You know, I think a lot of us like marched in the streets in June and July saying that black trans lives matter. Um, but like understanding what that really means, all the ways in which our laws make it not true, all the ways in which we show we don't act right now as if they matter, and the ways in which that just like fundamentally dehumanizes all of us, that if we aren't doing what's necessary to stand up for your humanity, like we're just dehumanizing all of us. So it's painful to hear the stories, um, but I'm really grateful for your leadership and courage and for your bringing them here. Like Zoom is like a hard place to tell painful stories, not that it's ever easy, but I'm really grateful for it. So, and of course, uh, Brian and Jared, thank you for, for your work in the fight. Um, mostly I just wanna say thank you, but I guess um, I will ask, um, because we have more work to do, obviously this is an area where people's um, prejudices have shifted rapidly through people doing the work and organizing and telling their stories and fighting, like attitudes are changing, you know, we're showing up, we're like identifying ourselves and understanding why with our pronouns, we're trying to change this law, but we got a lot more work to do. Like I still deal with a lot of people in my life who, um, who don't get it, who aren't comfortable enough yet. And I guess I just want to ask what you think is effective in moving people on this issue. Like we still have some work to do, not only to change the law at the state level, though that's obviously like a fight, a legislative fight, 
but we have work to do in our neighborhoods and our, our lives. And I just wonder, uh, you know, what you think we can be doing that is most effective in, you know, winning hearts and minds and changing, you know, people's attitudes on this issue so we can change both, you know, how we police and how we don't police um, and get rid of the vice squad and change the law, but also just make all of our workplaces and neighborhoods and organizations and communities um, fully equal and embracing places. I can, unless someone else wants to. Well, I was just going to add on to here, um, and I wanted to go circle back almost because I notes are a little scared of here today. Folks, bear with me. Um, but we really, I mean, I, I, I really do think that systemic change and legislative work really does help to shape hearts and minds. And so I'm very grateful for the council members who are on here today. And yet uh, the data that we've gotten is that this has happened in council member Barron's district. This has happened in council member Adams district. This has happened in council member Moya's districts, right? Um, when we look at where the uh, majority of arrests are, certainly drums, right? Um, so we need the council to be champions for these causes, right? To be here, to listen to the stories, to take those stories, to go back to the districts, to have town halls, to have folks listen to directly impacted folks, tell their stories, right? Um, to humanize the experiences, right? We need um, certainly our partners in Albany to understand that um, a tweet means very little if they're not willing to put uh, the political courage behind passing these bills, right? These bills have overwhelming support, as has been said before, right? We just need leaders to bring them to the floor for votes, as much in the council, as much as in the assembly, and as much as in the Senate. And what we don't need is for folks to worry that because they're in marginal seats or because of the ways in which they'll be considered, right? That it's not politically expedient. Well, excuse me, F that, right? Because communities don't care for about, about political experience, expediency. They're being murdered every single day, right? So what we need is for our elected officials to be really inconvenienced in supporting these issues in their communities, in the chambers, with their leaders, particularly when it's most inconvenient. To say that, um, yeah, they'll tweet about black, black lives and black trans lives, but beyond that, they're willing to expend the political capital to do what is right, to say that a vote must be held here and now. And that's just step one, right? But certainly as we've talked about- um, I'm you know, expired. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, did you want to finish your thought? Oh, I think, OK. Thank you. I was just going to say that, uh, I mean, it. Hold on. So we have oil in New York. I was just going to say that many of us, as Councilman uh, Lander said, we're out there uh, across the city and state, right, in the midst of a pandemic right, fighting for black lives, because we understand that our liberation and our lives are deeply connected and tied to our siblings' lives and their safety. That, that if we truly believe this, right, we are willing to risk that, right? We need our elected officials to take more risks, right? We, we understand the complexities that come in with it, but frankly, when we go back to our communities, they don't care, they, and they don't need to care. That's not their responsibility to care. It's for our government to do what is right. That's all that I wanted to say. Thank you, Councilwoman Rosenthal. Thank you. Next, we will have Councilmember Kalos for questions. Time starts now. Uh, thank you to Women and Gender Equity Chair Helen Rosenthal for hearing this important issue and elevating it to Councilmember Rivera for sponsoring these two resolutions. I'm a co-sponsor of both. Also to committee staff, Brenda McKinney, Chloe Rivera, Monica Peppel, for your work on these resolutions and to change the world around us. I also wanna thank you for adding my pronouns of he, his, him, as per my request. T.S. Candy, thank you for sharing what happened to you. It, what NYPD put you through is horrible. It shouldn't have happened to you and it should never happen again. 
I owe you an apology for voting to increase the number of police officers in our city. And that's part of why I voted against the budget because it did not actually defund the NYPD. And I'll continue to do the work that you are asking for and others are asking for to pull a billion dollars from funding from the NYPD to invest it in communities harmed by over-policing, including the black trans community, uh, as you so eloquently uh, spoken to. Uh, I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, what could the city council do to uplift trans women? And another one is just, uh, um, in what you've been talking about, and, and, and T.S. Candy, in your own experience, uh, there are, it, what, what is the story here in terms of uh, the, the, how problematic this law is, even when um, we're not seeing the same level of prosecutions as one would expect for the number of people who are stopped for it? Uh, I can briefly answer that second part. Um, so, it's the problem's twofold. One, because we just have a massive amount of violations that are that people are still uh, being discriminated uh, for uh, for having. Uh, you know, the first year that the statute passed, over ninety seven hundred people were arrested for it. Um, so until um, until the state realizes uh, both resolutions, like those people are still going to be impacted. Also, it's great if a DA declines to prosecute a case, but how long is that person sitting in custody? sometimes up to a day, sometimes a little bit longer because, you know, people run enough shot all over the constitution all the time. Um, that, and again, the people arrested under this is often trans women. Uh, jail is not fun for anyone. Uh, for trans women, it can be deadly. Um, so just the fact that the statute is still on the books and it gives police the ability to, to, uh, to arrest someone um, under it and to interfere with that person's life, um, it's, it's gonna be a problem. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Uh, I, I'm hoping to hear from T.S. Candy, who I think was just unmuted. Yes, um, I'm so sorry, you all. Um, that was News 12. That was um, I've just disconnected call. Um, I just want to be able to live. I just want to be able to, well, le actually learn how to live. I just want to be able to walk down the street and feel as if I don't have to worry about someone stopping me because of fashion, because what I'm wearing, fashion has criminalized black transgender women. Fashion has killed us. Fashion has made us, made vice police officers do state section, sexual violence against us. And no one hear us. I I'm here to hear you and listen. I think what one other question and one of my colleagues shared experience that Danny Drum had just, can you share some of the reasons why folks might be hanging out on the street? Because like I, I grew up in New York City and I had a single mom free and reduced school lunch. And so like for me, like there was no houses to hang out with. There were no backyards. Like if you were hanging out, and school was over at three or four, it got dark out, like it was on a stoop or it was in a park. Um, can you share about um, the, yes. how, how folks end up in, in a place where the cops can interact with them? Well, we have leaders and leadership that is given DHS and homeless, homeless shelters and private sectors and- and corporations opportunities to, I mean, giving them a reason to evict us and throw us out of housing. So due to a lot of us getting thrown out of housing into the streets, where else can we go? We in the streets, where can we go? When 
sometimes a lot of us are runaway youth because we are we don't know who we are or we trying to find our identity and no one understands us and we go to ACS and there's no bed for us or they have us in an area and they misgender and mistreat us so we go back to go back into the streets so it's really really important to understand that we don't want to be in the streets we don't choose the streets you all choose the streets for us because you all don't understand our humanity because y'all don't understand who we are as an individual because y'all are scared to understand us and because of fear because of y'all face fear because of y'all fear y'all criminalize us because of y'all fearness because of y'all scarcity and make us live out of scarcity to not want to live our truth it's not us we don't want to be in them streets we want housing we want employment we want education we need it we don't want we need that's a need but y'all take away our needs and then we're not stealing we're not killing, but we're we are the ones that are getting killed. And, and 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 we are just trying to live and we are utilizing our body and y'all criminalize the world's oldest profession. So and, and, and some of us is not even some of us when we get stopped in frisk, it makes us vulnerable. Some sometimes law enforcement is the ones that introduce us to it because they tell us about it. And they make us do it. And then they throw us into solidarity confinement. And now we dead, but we all know that the criminal justice system wasn't written to protect the black and brown lives. It was, officers just want to meet their quotas and they know where to go to meet their quotas. And that's to our areas because they have to meet their quotas. So we don't choose to be in them streets. Understand that. Understand due to policies, not including those that are infected, they written us out. We're written out. So look at us now. Now this, I yield back my time. Thank you. You have my full support. Thank you, Council Member Kalos. I will now call, uh, seeing no other council members waiting to ask questions, I will now turn it back to Chair Rosenthal for additional questions. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you, uh, Chloe. I just really wanna thank the panelists again. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your investment in addressing this issue. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I will now call witnesses in order for the second panel of public testimony. Mateo Taberes, TGNC Justice Leader Organizer, Make the Road New York. Norma Yoreo, Activist Organizer from Make the Road New York. And Jennifer Orellana, Activist Organizer from Make the Road New York. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on Mr. Taberas. Time starts now. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Mateo Guerrero, um, and I'm the TGNC IQ lead organizer at Make Through New York. Today, I'm testifying on the city's need to pass resolution 0923. Um, and also, I'm here to voice the importance of uh, in, uh, passing the legislation 1314 in order to protect black and brown, transgender, gender non binary, and queer communities in New York City. A major in New York is a membership based organization that builds the power of Latinx and working class communities to achieve dignity through justice, organizing, policy innovation, transformative education, and survival services. One of our uh, committees is the Trans Immigrant Project. Is a community organizing project led by and for transgender women of color in Jackson Heights. Uh, during our trip meetings, uh, we frequently discuss the violence and discrimination that our trans communities are facing, whether it is at the hands of strangers, employers, landlords, um, or police. And we also discuss the alternatives to address these issues by its roots. And so one of the forms of violence that is constantly brought up during the meetings is um, the ones that TGNCAQ and the communities are facing by, uh, as a result of being targeted by the police. 
um, by being questioned and stopped without any reason. And so section 24037 of the New York Penal Law gives the police excessive discretion and emboldens bias policing against transgender and gender non-conforming community members. And uh, troop members, particularly transgender immigrant women and women of color, um, like we heard from Yane, and soon we will hear from Norma and Jennifer, have, um, have stories about being arrested and profiled merely for standing outside and speaking to one another, walking with their par partners and other friends, or just walking from the subway to their home. Oftentimes they are followed by police cars with flashing lanterns, rushing them to open the door to their house to confirm that they are not in the area with the intention for loitering uh, for prostitution. This level of harassment comes with intimidation tactics, violence, and constant gender-based harassment from police officers. And as some other folks have mentioned, it has also resulted in sexual assault for many of our community members. Not only does this have an emotional, mental, mental and economic impact on our TGN, CNB communities, it also results in immigration consequences. For immigration purposes, it doesn't matter if the person record has been sealed, the person has still uh, has to answer the question of whether or not they have been arrested in the past, and they're forced to, uh, forced to explain the reason for the arrest. The disclosure of the arrest is what leads to a potential obstacle in um, adjusting their immigration status. Um, and this is indeed a threat uh, to transgender and non-binary immigrants who have come to the United States to find relief from violence um, at home. The idea of New York being a sanctuary city uh, does not include black and brown transgender immigrant women. And um, therefore that is the duty of New York City uh, City Council to end the pipeline from criminalization to deportation. And to summarize, I, I, I want to share that our members um, are intimately familiar with uh, bias policing encouraged under section 24037. This law has devastating consequences for our community members who um, not only in the legal system, but uh, criminal legal system, but also in by immigration enforcement. And so the city council must commit to pressure the state to repeal the penal code 24037 now and end this racist and transphobic penal code that has been part of the New York state law books uh, for over four decades. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Ms. Ureo? Time starts now. Hola, buenas, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Norma Ureiro. Soy una chica trans mexicana. Uh, estoy, eh, trabajo en la organización de Haciendo Camino en, en Nueva York. Voy a ser muy breve. Eh, estamos pidiendo, eh, demandando a la ciudad de Nueva York Eh, para la resolución del, del 0923 para eliminar el, estatalmente el código penal de la 24037, ambular con el propósito de prostitución y la policía utilizar este código penal para discriminar, dis, discriminarnos y hostigarnos y criminalizarnos. Yo voy a ser muy rápido. Eh, yo fui parada por la policía. Mi, mari, mi novio y yo fuimos arrestados en la 93 y Roosevelt. Veníamos saliendo de una fiesta y la policía uh, nos arrestó pensando que él era un cliente. Aún así, yo al policía le dije que yo traía un, tatu, un tatuaje con el nombre de mi novio y ellos no quisieron creerme. Aún así, nos arrestaron y nos llevaron al precinto pensando que él era un cliente mío. Eh, eso fue algo muy, muy desagradable para mí, una experiencia muy mal, muy mal. Anteriormente también tuve arresto estando caminando por la calle y un policía me, me paró, me encontró condones y con eso obtuvo para mandarme a, a la cárcel y ponerme este, prostitución. Y lamentablemente, como dice Vianney, muchas de mis compañeras transexuales no están en este momento porque muchas fueron deportadas, como yo fui deportada por ese caso de, de haber caminado y un policía haberme encontrado condones en mi bolsa. Eso me llevó a una deportación a mi país. Y creo que no es justo que la policía siga haciendo esto. Otra de las cosas, cuando uno trata de hablar con la policía, 
en español, que no, no, no hablo muy bien español. Ellos se ríen. Aparte de que se ríen, se ríen de mi apariencia femenina. Y me, ha, y me, obliga, y me obligan a darle mis no, mi nombre de hombre cuando yo soy una mujer transgénero. Cuando vas caminando por las calles, ellos te gritan, te echan una luz de la patrulla y te gritan por la, por la bocina, que te muevas. Lo gritan al público y eso es muy vergonzoso. Yo como mujer trans me siento hostigada, me siento con miedo de salir a la calle porque la policía me corre, me hostiga y no es justo. No quiero que siga pasando más con otras hermanas transexuales. Gracias. Thank you for our translation. We will now turn to Mr. Guerrero. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm an interpreter for Norma. Uh, my name is Norma Oreiro. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm a transgender woman from Mexico, um, and I'm here to demand that the city council passes resolution 0923 to repeal the penal code 24037, loitering with the intent for prostitution, because the police is using this penal code to discriminate, har discriminate harass, and criminalize transgender women like myself. I'm going to be very brief. Um, I'm going to share my story. I was stopped by the police while my boyfriend and I were walking down uh, on 93rd Street and Roosevelt Avenue. We were coming out of a party, and the police decided to arrest us, thinking that he was a client. I told the police that he wasn't a client, that he was my boyfriend, that I had his name tattooed on my body, but they didn't believe me. They still chose to not believe us. Um, they still arrested us and took us um, into the precinct. Um, then later on, I was also arrested for walking down the street. Um, a police officer saw me, stopped me, and found condoms in my bag. Um, and that was just enough of a reason for them to give me a charge on prostitution. Um, and like Vianese mentioned, uh, many of, our, of my transgender friends and siblings um, have been deported based on these interactions with the police. I was also deported for walking down the street and carrying these condoms. This uh, interaction with the police is what led to my deportation a couple of years ago. Um, and it is not fair for the police to continue to do this. Uh, I also want to share that um, the mistreatment and misconduct of the police is ongoing. Even when I have tried to talk to them, um, they make fun of my accent and make fun of my appearance as a transgender woman. Um, and they many times have many times have forced forced me to say my male name. Um, when you're walking down the street, um, they put loud speakers telling us to go home. They keep on harassing us and this is unfair and this needs to end now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Next, we will hear from uh, Ms. Oriana. Time starts now. Hello, Ms. Cushan, you hear me? Sí. Okay. Mi nombre soy Jennifer Lorellana Delgado. Soy una mujer trans puertorriqueña de 48 años de edad. Me he dedicado al mundo del espectáculo por más de 20 años y he trabajado en diversos clubs en la Avenida Rupert. Avenida donde se encuentran todos los clubs de la comunidad LGBTQI. El sábado primero de junio, víspera de la parada Orgullo LGBT en Queen, me encontraba trabajando en el Club Evolution ubicado en la 77 calle y Roosevelt Avenue. Terminando mi show aproximadamente a las 1 y 45 de la mañana, salgo del club con mi maleta en mano en dirección al Club Music Box ubicado en la 74 calle y Roosevelt Avenue, al cual tenía una presentación a las dos y media de la mañana. Cuando voy en camino a, por la calle, se detiene un vehículo con dos hombres encubiertos. Uno de ellos se baja y me pregunta que hacia dónde yo voy. Yo le digo que voy caminando hacia el Club Music Box porque iba a trabajar, había salido del Club Evolution y iba de camino a hacer otro show. Él me dijo que, que yo llevaba en la maleta. Cogió mi maleta, le abrió, observó que dentro de la maleta había ropa de, de espectáculos, volvió y me entregó la maleta, yo la cerré, y él me comenta con su voz amenazante de que él sabía lo que yo estaba haciendo en la calle, que yo estaba buscando clientes, y que si yo iba para el club que le mencionaba, en las 74 calles, que me fuera caminando por ahí. Procede él a dejarme seguir caminando y junto 
se monta nuevamente en su vehículo y junto con una linterna me van llevando hacia el frente del club hasta que yo logro entrar. Todo eso pasó desde las 76 calles hasta las 74. Yo como mujer trans siendo alumbrada con una linterna hasta el frente del club, donde todo el mundo me miraba con cara de asombro porque no entendían el por qué este carro me alumbraba con una linterna. Al salir a las 4 de la mañana del club, cuando voy a esperar el taxi, me percato que al cruzar la calle está el mismo carro con los dos hombres observándome. Y el que se había bajado del carro toca su mirada y me señala como en indición de que estoy vigilando lo que tú estás haciendo. Ahí yo procedo a montarme dentro del taxi e irme nuevamente a mi casa que vivo en Brooklyn. De esta manera, la comunidad trans, inmigrante trans de color, somos hostigadas de poder caminar en las calles libremente como lo hace todo el mundo. Y es hora de ponerle un paro al Código Penal 240.37, donde solo la comunidad trans se siente oprimida. Porque nosotros como comunidad claro, claro. trans, porque nuestro existir es resistir. Gracias por su atención. Thank you for translation. We will now turn to Mr. Guerrero. Hi again. Um, I'm going to interpret for Jennifer. So my name is Jennifer Orellana. Um, I am a transgender woman and I'm 48 years old and I'm Puerto Rican. I'm here to testify on resolution 0923. For over, uh, for over 20 years, I have dedicated myself to the entertainment business and I have worked in various clubs on Roosevelt Avenue, a well-known avenue since there are many LGBTQ clubs located in this area. On Saturday, June 21st, on the eve of the gay parade in Queens, I was working at Evolution Club located on 74, 77th and Roosevelt Avenue. And when I was finishing my show around 1.45 a.m., I left the club with my suitcase headed to another club called Music Box, which is located on 74th Street and Roosevelt Avenue. Suddenly at the corner of 75, 75th Street, uh, uh, a guy uh, gets out of a vehicle Um, and then he stops me and asks me, what are you doing here? I tell him that I was going to Music Box, uh, which is a club uh, to work as a performer. Then he asked, he answered that he knows what I'm doing in these streets. Um, and then he proceeded to look inside my bag without my consent. Uh, and he saw my outfits and then he said that I was, um, uh, th that I was looking for clients. Um, he told me to keep walking and to go to the club, but that if he saw me again walking on Roosevelt Avenue, he was going to arrest me. The officer was accusing me of looking for clients and of working as a sex worker solely based on my gender identity and the clothes that I was wearing. Uh, the cop got into the car and then followed me until I got to the club. They followed me for over two blocks with really bright lights and everyone was surprised uh, to see the police escorting me in that way. Um, after finishing my show around 4 a.m., I went to take a taxi and I realized that the vehicle was still parked on the corner of 74th Street, probably waiting for me to get out of music box or waiting for other uh, transgender women to harass them. Um, and he gave me a sign letting me know that he was surveilling me and watching after me. Uh, today, as a transgender woman, I demand that we have the right to walk freely in the streets and to end this harassment from the police um, and to pass the resolution 09. Two, three, to pressure the state to repeal Penal Code 24037. It is time to end discrimination and harassment just for who we are um, because our existence is our resistance. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Rosenthal for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Chloe. Uh, I know I'm stating the obvious, but uh, Ms. Garcia, Ms. Urero, and Ms. Oriana, I see you. I recognize who you are. You are powerful. You are beautiful. And um, I'm sure it's not easy to tell your story over and over and over again. You should know that by doing so, you are helping us. You are helping us push legislation to stop 
this terrible behavior on behalf of the police department. What has happened to you is outrageous. Shouldn't happen to anyone. Um, I am just honored to be in your presence. Um, I do have one question that anyone should feel free to answer or, um, and it's that I'd like to hear a little more if possible about the trans immigrant project. Mateo, maybe you can talk about this. Um, you talked about it being led by and for trans women of color. So I just wanna hear a bit more from this panel about the work you're doing the challenges and needs facing trans immigrant women of color. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, so the Trans Immigrant Project is a project that uh, at Make the Road New York. Uh, we're located in Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, TRIP is particularly located in Queens and a lot of the work that we do is to um, provide support and protection for our trans communities. It is led by transgender and gender non-conforming individuals, uh, being a, a transgender woman, same for, for Jennifer and Norma, and I myself, a transgender man. Um, all of us who are immigrants in this country and who have faced uh, several obstacles in trying to adjust our status. Um, and what we do and Make the Road is that um, we think about, we, we advocate for different health policies, uh, police accountability policies um, that can protect our transgender women as well as um, housing issues. And so I, then I can share more about this, um, but particularly one of the things that has impacted our community is the interactions with the police. We are also in the fight to defund the NYPD and definitely advocating to end the vice squads uh, that has uh, constantly harassed many of us, including me, um, at one of our local bars here in, in Jackson Heights. Um, and so one, one of the ways to end that form of violence is reducing the contact and interaction between the police with our community members. Um, and that is why it is important to repeal Penal Code 247 and also to pass many more legislations that end the criminalization of poverty and the criminalization of existence. And as Brian mentioned earlier, um, it is important that our laws reflect uh, or that our laws actually encourage our communities to change and shift. If the state and, in the, and if the city make a statement where they say that transgender women are not to be profiled just for existing, then our communities will follow. Um, so that, that is all, thank you. I invite anyone else who would like to respond. Um, Ms. Garcia. Um, yeah, so, basicamente, uh, Mateo is gonna help me with interpretation. Um, TRIP nació en el 2000, 6, 2007, eh, con un grupo de jóvenes que querían you know, aprender cosas nuevas sobre su sexualidad, cuando de repente vimos que mujeres trans estaban llegando al grupo de apoyo, ¿verdad? que era específicamente para, para jóvenes. Ellas traían eh, problemáticas que son realmente importantes dentro de nuestra comunidad, tales cual la discriminación del empleo, el abuso policial, eh, que eran sobrevivientes de crímenes de odio, que eran discriminadas en vivienda y todo eso eh, decidimos eh, tener un grupo de apoyo para mujeres trans y así fue que nació el grupo um, TRIP, The Trans Immigrant Project. Um, hacemos todo lo posible para mantener a nuestra comunidad trans eh, organizada y um, pues más que nada que aprendan sobre sus derechos, ¿verdad? Anteriormente a cualquier mujer trans era golpeada en la calle y no decía nada por el miedo de, de, de simplemente expresar su género y, de, y por ser una persona que hace trabajo sexual por sobrevivencia. Entonces nosotros enseñamos a ellos cuáles son sus derechos, eh, tanto en vivienda, de discriminación laboral. Eh, y en muchas ocasiones me ha tocado llevar a, a mujeres trans que son trabajadoras sexuales a hacer un reporte policial ya que desafortunadamente la policía no existe para nosotras, no están. A nosotros me ha tocado, a mí me ha tocado ver cómo la policía se ríe de las personas que hacen trabajo sexual o de simplemente por expresar nuestro género, como estaba diciendo la compañera Norma. Somos criminalizadas, somos la burla de la policía. En, ya estamos cansadas de eso. Thank you. Uh, 
right? For the purposes of translation, this is for from Yane as a trip. Uh, the Transimmigrant Project was born in 2006, 2007 um, to create a space for, for youth to share their identity and explore their uh, sexual orientation. Um, however, with the passing of time, many more transgender women were coming to the group um, that was originally for youth. Um, they started bringing up issues about employment discrimination, police violence and police abuse, survival of hate violence um, and discrimination in housing. Um, and so we created a support group for particularly for transgender women. Um, we do everything possible to continue to organize our trans communities and learn about their uh, and teach them and share their rights. Um, in the past, many transgender women have, were assaulted in the streets um, and they were afraid to even say that out loud just for existing in public. Um, but now they know their rights and um, they have the support to navigate these uh, forms of violence. In many occasions, I have had to um, uh, support sex workers um, when interacting with the police because the police, we know that it doesn't exist for us. Um, I have seen how the police laughs at sex workers and, and many of us uh, who identify as trans because of our gender identity. Um, and I see how we are a joke to the police. Thank you. Uh, we will now turn to uh, Council Member Dharma Diaz for questions. Time starts now. Councilmember Diaz, a member of our staff should have uh, requested to unmute you and you just need to accept. Um, please let us know if it's a different problem. Chloe, may I suggest we um, turn to Councilmember Ayala while the um, technical issues get worked out with Council Member Diaz? Yes, of course. Uh, please, Council Member Ayala. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I didn't have any questions because I think all of my questions have actually been answered quite uh, thoroughly throughout this uh, this hearing. I wanted to thank Chair Rosenthal and, and Council Member Rivera for really leading this conversation. Um, I'm happy to be a co-sponsor uh, as well, pero quería este, darle las gracias especialmente a Vianney, um, a Norma, a Jennifer por uh, su testimonio hoy. Yo sé que no es fácil um, tener que entrar a este tipo de, de ambiente y, y, y tam, a veces, you know, ponerse en una, en una situación a veces vulnerable, pero es importante decir nuestras historias porque nuestras historias son las historias de nuestros compañeros, de nuestras vecinas. Y, y quiero que sepan que, que nosotros tienen nuestro apoyo completo y que estamos aquí para ayudarles, pero su testimonio hoy nos ayuda a nosotros a poder mejorar uh, las leyes que, que las protejan y, y las, las mantengan miembros de, de, sus, de sus comunidades um, en una manera que no sean uh, hostigadas por la policía. Y, y solamente quería decir eso, que estoy muy orgullosa de, de ustedes por venir hoy Um, y que ojalá nos, 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 nos vean como compañeras en este trabajo, en este esfuerzo y que estamos aquí siempre para apoyar. So, muchísimas gracias por venir hoy. Council member, I, I think it was um, beautiful of you to thank them in Spanish. Um, may I ask you to translate? Yes. Uh, summary? So I, just wanted, I just wanted to share that um, one, I'm very proud of the testimony today. I know that it is not easy to um, to come into this type of forum and share information that makes us all feel vulnerable, but that it is important as part of this work um, to share these stories because they're not just our stories, they're the stories of our neighbors and our sisters and our partners. Um, and that these testimonies help us as a legislative body to help 
the, the, the trans community um, feel safer in their own communities. And it helps us do the work that we need to do. So I wanted to, to just express how proud I am um, of everything that has been said here today, of all of the advocacy work. Um, I know so many of you um, on this panel today, and I know how hard you work each and every single day. And I wanted to reiterate that we are partners in this and that you, sh you know, I hope that you consider us um, you know, partners in, in, in your efforts. Um, and just to say thank you. Council member, thank you for sharing that in Spanish and English. Really appreciate you. Gracias, Helen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, council member Ayala. Uh, can we see if council member Diaz is able to speak? It seems we are having technical difficulties. Um, we will now, not seeing any more council member hands raised, we will now move on to the next panel. I will call witnesses in order for the third panel of public testimony. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and you may begin your testimony. Remember that there is a few second delay when you are unmuted before we can hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before st starting your testimony. I will now call on Elisa Crespo. Time starts now. I'm sorry, did you say Elisa? Yes, you may begin. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, so first and foremost, I, I just want to start by saying that this is a racial and gender justice issue. Um, you know, penal law section 247 is, is not only archaic, but it primarily impacts women of color, as you know, particularly trans women of color, which is why we're all here. Um, trans women and women of color should not be profiled because of how they dress or who they choose to congregate with or where they choose to congregate. Trans women have been arrested for walking down the street with their spouse, for standing at bus stations, waiting for the bus. It's absurd. And there are real life consequences as a result. Some of our undocumented trans sisters have ended up in the hands of ICE because of penal law section 24037. Moreover, I believe that the NYPD vice squad that executes this law should not exist. In a time when people are facing evictions, when our infrastructure is crumbling, when we don't have enough funds to, to have adequate PPE for essential workers, targeting women of color with the vice squad and section 24037 is a waste of taxpayer dollars. There are even allegations of vice squad members sexually assaulting and abusing women of color who are profiled under this penal law. I have firsthand experience with vice squad officers an experience that has caused me to suffer post-traumatic stress disorder for years after one of them pointed a gun to my head. So very frankly, this is a moral and political stain on our city. I've gone up to Albany and spoke to the powers that be to give them firsthand account of why we need to move forward on repealing penal law section 24037. All of us know that the bill has overwhelming support in both chambers in Albany and we should stop worrying about what's politically expedient and we should bring the, the vote, the, the bill to the floor for a vote. I know that all of the advocates here will not stop pushing this issue. I wanna thank all of you who have fought, fought so hard for this. And I also wanna thank the Women's Caucus, council members, Carlina Rivera, Helen Rosenthal, Diana Ayala, Vanessa Gibson, um, Farrah Lewis and all of the other women in the council who are part of the caucus for uh, moving forward with this hearing. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, the next three panelists I'm going to name and then I'll call them in order will be Chinyere Izi, uh, Kai Z. Cole, and Tanya Walker. Uh, Chinyere, uh, sorry, Miss Miss Izi, you may begin. Time starts now.
Thank you so much. Pleasure to be with you. My name is Chinyere Ezie, and I'm a senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. I'm joining the call today to pass Resolution 0923, as well as Resolution 1444, which call upon the New York State Legislature to repeal the archaic New York State Statute PL 24037, loitering for the purposes of engaging in prostitution, and to seal past convictions under the statute. As you've heard today, PL 24037 is an unconstitutional policy of stop and frisk that disproportionately targets women of color, including and in particular transgender New Yorkers. It targets individuals in these communities for arbitrary arrest, as well as police profiling and harassment. And by doing so, PL 24037 revives the unconstitutional policy of stop and frisk that was struck down as unconstitutional in a case that my organization, the Center for Constitutional Rights brought called Floyd versus City of New York. Because it allows New Yorkers, particularly women of color and transgender women of color to be stopped, searched and arrested on the vague and non-evidence-based assumption that they may be engaged in sex work. Now, when I say that it is not evidence-based, what I want you to be clear on is the ways that police have come to enforce the statute against Black and Latinx New Yorkers. Many people, including trans women, have been arrested simply for wearing a skirt, wearing tight jeans, or a tight-fitting dress, showing cleavage, or standing somewhere other than a bus stop or taxi stand. And that's by, um, in the words of NYPD officers themselves who have enforced this statute across the city. Transgender women are also arrested under the statute simply by people who are um, gazing <laughs> and trying to see whether people who are in dresses have Adam's apples, as you've heard earlier today. And transgender women in particular have complained about being arrested or stopped under 204037 while doing simple things like going to the grocery store in their community, walking to public transportation, or simply trying to meet friends which is why the bill has been nicknamed the Walking While Trans Ban. Although the New York, um, the NYPD vowed to halt its biased enforcement of 2040-37 um, following a 2016 lawsuit, the problem of arbitrary arrests continue unabated. In 2018, there was a 120% increase in arrests under PL 2040-37, including a 47% arrest in increase in arrest in Queens. Black and Latinx women also remain the most impacted by this statute as 91% of people who are arrested. Uh, might I have permission to conclude? Yeah, of course, please. Okay. 91% of people arrested under the statute are Black and Latinx, as well as 80% um, being women. And even when these charges are dropped, the consequences of being arrested have um, are severe. It's very difficult for people with convictions under the statute to secure good jobs or housing because of criminal background checks that will follow you throughout life. As you've heard today, immigrants who are arrested under the statute often face the threat of deportation. And that's why in addition to repeal, we're urgently asking that past convictions under the statute be sealed. We are so grateful that the New York City um, Council has taken this issue so seriously and therefore we urge for the passage of resolution 0923 and resolution 1444 because it's time that we repeal PL24037 and bring this unconstitutional scourge of stop and frisk to an end. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next we will hear from Tanya Walker. Time starts now. Hello. Uh, it's still morning, so good morning, Chair Rosenthal and members of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My name is Tanya Azapanza Johnson Walker, and I am the co founder of New York Transgender Advocacy Group and a U.S. Army veteran, and currently co chair at Equality New York the largest statewide advocacy organization working to advance equality and justice for LGBTQI New Yorkers. Equality New York 
is an advocacy organization that unites and amplifies the social and political voices of the LGBTQI communities throughout New York State. We work to advance equality and justice for all LGBTQI New Yorkers and their families as well. Equality New York uses an intersectional lens to ensure equitable outcomes for our community. I would like to thank you for holding this important hearing and I am here to let you know that we strongly support Resolution 0923 pertaining to repealing the Walking Wild Trans Bill and Resolution 1444 pertaining to sealing convictions for loitering for the purposes of engaging in prostitution. In 2000, I was living in Harlem and I received a call from my sister who lived in the Bronx at 2.30 in the morning. And she stated she had lost her keys and needed uh, the spare set that I had for her at my house. So I said, okay, meet me in an hour and I'll be there. It was still early morning, so I decided to walk to, third, to the Third Avenue Bridge here in Harlem. After I arrived at the bridge and started walking on it, three police cars pulled over and shouted at me and other transgender women to not move or don't move. The police requested to see our ID and began to write tickets after they checked us for warrants. I told them I had an emergency and the officer began writing the ticket to appear in court. I was detained for an hour and a half uh, because I had a family emergency and I'm transgender. These resolutions will allow others to deal with family emergencies. For example, another innocent person will not have to worry about getting a ticket or being arrested just for taking a spare set of keys to a sibling in desperate need. B being transgender is not a crime. And I ask you, I ask that you validate that by passing resolution 020, 0923 and resolution 1444, the transgender, gender non-conforming and non-binary community here in New York City is counting on you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. As Kai Z. Cole uh, is not currently logged in, we are going to move to Audacia Ray, if you are available. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and good morning to Chair Rosenthal, Council Member Rivera, and the entire Committee on Women and Gender Equity. Uh, my name is Audacia Ray, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Director of Community Organizing and Public Advocacy at the New York City Anti-Violence Project, also known as ADP. Uh, I'm a queer woman, I'm a survivor of violence and, and a former sex worker, and as a cis white woman, I aspire to be an ally to black and brown trans women and femmes. Uh, I have some longer written testimony that I'm going to submit by email, but um, for today, I just wanted to underscore four, hopefully quick points. Uh, as Jared talked about a little bit earlier in response to a question from Chair Rosenthal, um, the Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens DAs have already stopped prosecuting um, 24037. And Manhattan, I think, has been doing that since 2015. So it's been um, a, you know, a number of years that the Manhattan DA has been declining to prosecute. And I, I want to say that the, these experiments have not increased trafficking or exploitation in the sex trades. And instead, they're a step towards creating greater safety for women and TGNC people in our city. So really, like throughout the city, DAs and police precincts could and should make the choice today to stop prosecuting this charge. Um, but that hasn't been happening, so we do need this state level bill so that that, um, that decision doesn't shift um, with the election of each DA. Um, and so that is something that, that can be established statewide that um, the bill that, that 24037 should be repealed completely. Um, my second point is uh, that starting with the fiscal year 2020, city council started funding the early stages of work on the city resource center for people in the sex trades. Um, ABP is one of the organizations that receive funds to do outreach to LGBTQ people in the sex trades as part of the initiative. And one of the things that we've been hearing from um, community members is that they're afraid that if they go to access services, 
at sites that are known as participants in um, that resource center that um, just going to access services will get them targeted um, for 230, 37, um, which is really concerning that our city is creating um, this funding to be able to support people in accessing service, ne their needs and getting services and that folks don't wanna use them because they're afraid that that could lead to criminalization. Um, so, so that's a really important aspect of it and, and repealing 24037 um, would help to make people safer though it's not the band-aid that will fix everything. Um, thirdly, in AVP's work of supporting survivors, we run a 24-7 hotline and I'm over sorry. the summer, um, I have one and a half things left to go. Um, oh, go. Uh, Odisha, please. Sure. Um, so we've heard through our hotline over the summer, many people who participated in the uprisings over the summer um, that they were being targeted as TGNC people of color, particularly um, black femmes and trans women. Um, and so they were experiencing violence from police as during the, those uprisings. Um, and this, and this uh, law on the books is, is one of the ways that police um, can can be justified in, in doing that harassment. Um, so we must really curtail the power of the police to profile and harass marginalized communities. And I also wanna boost the call to defund the police starting with the vice squad. Um, lastly, I wanna say that although 24037 is a state level criminal code, um, arrests are concentrated in New York City and there's this kind of ongoing finger pointing about whether it's the city or the state's responsibility to resolve this discriminatory policing pra practice. So I just wanna encourage the Committee on Women and Gender Equity and the whole city council to not just pass these resolutions, but also keep looking at proactive ways that the city can lead on this issue and make life safer for black and brown trans women and femmes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Rosenthal for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate that you have a question for this panel. Chair Rosenthal. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists. Uh, really appreciate you all. Uh, Adisha, can I uh, just ask uh, two questions? First, as you were just mentioning um, about what more New York City can do. Would you like to talk about that just a little bit more, maybe an example or two? Yeah, I mean, I think the the funding piece is is really key that um, funding needs to go directly to um, black trans women to support their needs. Um, and so, you know, funding people to be housed um, is really, really key and not just like emergency survivor housing, but permanent long term housing um, goes a long way to keeping people safe. Um, and so, like I said, like the DAs and police precincts can stop prosecuting these charges. Um, the city could stop the operation of the human trafficking intervention courts um, and make the move to seal all the cases going through those courts. Um, so it's, it, it's really a combination of um, shifting funding. So um, defunding, vice defunding, NYPD, and rerouting that money directly to um, Black TGNC people um, and uh, trans immigrants of color, um, and then also like taking away um, the the you know the very real ways that the city um, does prosecute and keep people within the system. Um, we haven't talked about it that much today, but the human trafficking courts keep people stuck in the system. Um, for, for a very long time, all with the goal of um, getting cases dismissed. But while they're going through the process of the courts, um, folks have an open case um, and that's really harmful and also makes it really difficult for folks to get um, other employment if they want it and to get housing. Um, so I think, you know, kind of closing that loophole, you know, really like chopping out that process um, by not entrapping people in that system would be really helpful. Thank you and thank you for your dedication. Uh, you're an extraordinary advocate. 
Thank you. I'll now turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I will now call on council members with questions in the order that they have used the raise hand function in Zoom. Seeing no raise hands at this time, I will turn to the next panel. which will include Brian Ellicott from Princess Janae Place, Andy Bowen, a consultant with Sex Workers Project in the Urban Justice Center, and Jillian Modzlecki, a staff attorney for Victims of Trafficking Defense Unit at the Brooklyn Defender Services. Brian Ellicott, you may begin when the sergeant has gives you the cue. Your time starts now. Uh, I'm going to start by saying good afternoon since it's a minute to noon. So good afternoon, members of the Committee on Women, Women and Gender Equity, Chairperson Helen Rosenthal, Council Member Rivera, and all the members of the City Council who have co-sponsored Resolution 923 and Resolution 1444. We at Princess Janae Place both support, support both of these resolutions. My name is Brian John Ellicott. My pronouns are he, they, and I am the program coordinator at Princess Janae Place located in the Bronx. The mission of Princess Janae Place is to help people of trans experience maximize their full potential as they transition from homelessness to independent living. Princess Janae Place fulfills our mission by offering safe space for people of trans experience to connect with community, access gender affirming support, as well as engage in educational and recreational activities. Princess Janae Place serves as a critical referral resource for our members to secure housing navigation, substance use, and mental health resources, legal assistance, job training, and placement for health care. Here at Princess Janae Place, every day we are assisting people in the need for housing and other assistance, and almost 65% of our current clients, both transgender women, trans men, and non-binary New Yorkers, have engaged in some sort of sex work or have been targeted as being sex workers when they are not in their lifetime. Of that 65%, a little less than 50% of them have stated that they have been convicted of a misdemeanor or felony. We have 12% of our clients currently on probation. This is currently impacts our clients' ability to retain employment and housing and often their citizenship status. No person should be targeted as a sex worker or on the basis of maybe being a sex worker or worker based on what we're wearing. We have said this time and time again that clothing and presentation does not warrant bias towards other people. No person should be targeted for the use of, of carrying sex safe protections in their, in, their, in their person or in their bag. No, we need to do more when it comes to protecting all people. And we need to actually defund the police, specifically vice and give money back to communities and organizations that do the work and provide services to TGNC and non-binary communities like Princess Janae Place. Princess Janae Place was not funded in the 2020 budget. Uh, we could have been if we had taken more money from the NYPD to continue the work that's done in the community. And we need so much more support from the New York City Council and state legislator, le legislature. These kinds of outdated laws have, been de have a devastating impact on those affected by targeting their basic qualities of life, their jobs, housing, and citizenship status. This is why we need to pass it, get re repeal the section of the bill, and we need to expunge the records of those who have been persecuted by the effects of this piece of legislation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Ms. Bowen. Your time starts now. My name is Andrea Bowen. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a consultant for the Sex Workers Project at the Urban Justice Center. Um, the Sex Workers Project at Urban Justice Center provides client-centered legal services to individuals who engage in sex work, regardless of whether they do so by choice, circumstance, or coercion. I'm also a transgender woman, and I'm testifying in solidarity with Black, Latinx, and all transgender people of color who've been subject to state violence due to PL 24037. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, council members and staff supporting the Committee on Women and Gender Equity for holding this hearing. And thank you to council member Rivera and co-sponsoring colleagues for introducing resolutions uh, 923 and 1444. As regards resolutions 923 and 1444, we wanna first state our support and deep admiration for the coalition working on repeal of the walking wall trans ban. Um, 
beyond that, it, echoing their, their points that they've made, the racial disparity is inherent in this law's enforcement and its targeting of intersectional, intersecting marginalized identities, especially Black and Latinx transgender people, are a profound injustice. These demographic outcomes make our own clients sex workers project at great risk of targeting with BIPOC communities and women of transgender experience making up an enormous proportion of our clients. Your support of repealing PL 24037 is integral. The state must pass uh, Senate Bill 2253 Assembly 654, and it's unacceptable that it hasn't yet become law. As we know, majorities of the Assembly and Senate support these, and all pressure must be put on a Senate and Assembly leadership to pass and the governor to sign. We also support resolution 1444 and in line with how everyone has been discussing this resolution in the hearing, we back fellow community members in recommending a change to the language and the bill text convictions should be changed to violations. Many people have unsealed violations under the current loitering statutes and councils should push for and the legislature and governor should follow suit that violations of the loitering statutes be sealed with the law applying retroactively. Um, I also want to voice support for what people have said regarding the need to defund vice vice within the larger NYPD budget is as of my last check of NYC open data a few minutes ago is over $18 million. This funding is the cause of violence to our communities it's morality based policing which has no place in our vision of justice, this funding should be used to better protect people's human rights, including a right to livelihood housing, health, bodily autonomy, and other vital resources. The possibilities of divesting from vice and investing in services that will really heal our community are astounding and must be carried forward by the mayor and city council as soon as humanly possible. Thank you so much for your attention to these issues, holding these hearings, and constantly being in conversation with marginalized communities to address longstanding and ongoing injustice. Thank you. Last on this panel, we will hear from Ms. Modzleski. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jillian Modzleski and I'm a senior trial attorney with Brooklyn Defender Services, their Women's Defense Project. Uh, this specialized project serves women who have a history of violence, exploitation and abuse that has directly or indirectly led to their involvement in the criminal legal justice system. I also practice in the Human Trafficking Intervention Court where I represent sex workers and victims of trafficking who have come in contact with the criminal legal system. I'd like to thank the Human Tra I'd like to thank the New York City Council Committee on Women and Gender Equity and in particular Chair Helen Rosenthal for the opportunity to testify today. BDS supports both Resolution 923 and Resolution 1444 regarding loitering for the purposes of prostitution. New York Penal Law 24037, which criminalizes loitering for the purpose of prostitution, which is commonly referred to as the walking while trans ban or the stop and frisk for women, uh, <clears throat> is bias enforcement. This statute serves only to give law enforcement the discretion to profile, arrest, and charge those whom officers deem likely to commit prostitution in the future or those whom they want to harass. Enforcement of the law, if not the law itself, is patently sexist, racist, and transphobic. Repealing the New York Penal Law 24037 is racial justice issue and a gender justice issue, but it's also a New York City issue. In 2019, 75% of arrests for loitering for the purpose of prostitution came from Queens and Brooklyn alone. We commend the council for introducing resolutions 923 and 1444, which call on the state legislature to pass legislation to repeal New York Penal Law 24037 and allow sealing of all 24037 violations. Passing these resolutions would show Senate and assembly leadership that the city is committed to ending the gender bias stop and frisk. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now turn to Chair Rosenthal for questions. Oh gosh, I just wanna thank everyone who testified, um, you know, very, very much. Um, 
Brian, I always want to give you a special shout out for the amazing work you've done and leadership that you've shown and patience that you've had with me. Um, but I, if we could uh, open up the mic for Audacia Ray again, and I'd like to ask all the panelists um, if, if you have thoughts on this. Um, I, I, um, I, I guess my question is primarily for Jillian as a lawyer. Um, what legal recourse and resources are available to individuals who have been affected by walking while trans? Um, and also, is there anything people can do now uh, to deal with convictions under the statute? Um, I'm just gonna keep going with questions for a half a second because I really want anyone to feel free to jump in. What could the city do to improve outcomes? Um, how about in terms of connecting people to resources? Um, how about, uh, um, I, uh, I'm a little confused. So if, if folks could please oh. advise about that. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. And also efforts to connect those who ex experienced harassment um, or discrimination under the statute. Thank you. Sure. I, I think I'll start by saying I think that there's a misunderstanding um, that has been perpetuated by the trafficking courts that um, in order for women who are um, victims of trafficking to get services, they have to be arrested. Um, that is not the case. They can be connected to services in their community um, on their own um, through medical professional, professionals, counseling services. A lot of the organizations that are here today giving testimony, um, they can go to those organizations. So I think that um, there is definitely a misperception that the courts are the only way that people can get uh, support and services. Um, and just echoing what everyone has said here, defunding the police and putting the money into those organizations that um, <clears throat> might be able to provide them with um, more visibility to those in the community who need um, that support. Um, so I, I would just echo that, the defunding of the police. Uh, with respect to what um, any, anything that people can do post conviction, um, there is a- I interrupt just for one sure. quick, I'm gonna follow up on what you just said. Um, you know, one frustration I always have with this administration is around messaging and communication. And it's such a simple step. And you gave a beautiful example. People should know you don't have to end up in court to access these services. And there are a lot of services available in the city. Not to say there aren't wait lists and they're overwhelmed uh, for sure and we should be putting more money into it. But, but another thing, if this one thing comes out from this hearing that the services are available and I just really appreciate the way you said it, you don't have to land in court before getting these services. Um, and of course, all the community groups that are testifying here today and the advocates make the road, you know, exceptional, exceptional groups. Sorry to interrupt, I, you just made a great point. Um, I think the second question you asked was what um, the what people who have convictions can do. Um, there is a, a motion that people with criminal convictions can make to a court, um, to a judge, to vacate prior convictions that um, <clears throat> are directly related to their trafficking. Um, there is current legislation, I believe, in front of the state Senate and Jared or, or Melissa or anybody else on this call could probably speak better to it, but it would expand the ability for people with convictions related to their trafficking to uh, vacate those convictions. Um, at this point in time, they do have to make a motion to uh, a judge. Um, the prosecution has the ability to oppose that motion. 
Um, and then a judge ultimately has the decision, makes the decision, decision on whether or not those convictions can be vacated. So that is, um, that's something that they have the ability to do. Unfortunately, those motions um, don't necessarily help clients that are um, non-citizens because those convictions stay on your record for purposes of immigration and that the damage is already done. So, um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's problematic for our, our clients who are non-citizens. Thank you. And I see a few people have flipped their video, uh, video. so if others so, who- As a, as a nonprofit uh, organization, what I wanna say that to echo what Jillian has said is that, you know, if we just defunded VICE at the NYPD and gave that money to small up and coming nonprofits like Princess Janae Place, we could assist in helping people who have been directly impacted by this piece of the penal code with funding, like finding housing, helping finding jobs once their records are sealed. That money just has to come out of places that have done harm and into the communities that are there to do the work. Um, and, you know, like I said, Princess Janae Place didn't get any city funding this year. We could have if we had actually defunded the police in a way that was what we thought was going to happen, which didn't happen. So I think it's just looking at ways to uplift community is how we, we, we fix this going forward. Thank you. And if any of the other panelists who have spoken today, uh, I see some others, if you wanna um, speak just, and you can't unmute yourself, just hit the raise hand um, button and and we'll find a way to unmute you. But if anyone else wants to answer, please. Andy? Yeah, just look at thinking about all of this. Um, I was just back and forth with my colleagues at Sex Workers Project and just thinking about all of this from a human rights perspective. Um, we don't adequately characterize things like supportive housing and health resources and et cetera as rights. <laughs> um, I always emphasize that there are resources also that have to go into that, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, the 18, the greater than $18 million, um, and I just emailed over uh, the open data stuff that I found, <laughs> um, is just astounding. I mean, like, I think a supportive housing unit rehab is something like 150,000. I know capital and expense are, are different budgets, but like just comparing like what the city prioritizes, um, especially in light of this hearing, especially in light of COVID and all of the obvious injustices happening to people on the street. Um, it is, uh, it's, it's really glaring. Um, so anyway, um, generally just urging that we, we think as many of your, the colleagues and councils can possibly, you know, note that's 18 million is a lot of dollars. Thank you. Um, I see uh, someone's hand is raised. Yes, um, T.S. Candy, um, Executive Director from Black Trans Nation. Um, I would like to say, first off, thank you to everyone that came and spoke and spoke their narrative and spoke their truth and um, the trauma and having to revisit all the trauma and the... the we, we need to learn how, um, how can we invest in organizations, especially black trans organizations, um, all of us, not only just Pacific, but all of the organizations that's out here doing the work, how can we protect our mental health? How can we invest in making sure that not only, you know, we have housing, sustainable housing, long-term housing, um, employment, financial, financial uh, assistance, educational GED programs, um, back to work programs, just 
how can we how can we unconstitute i mean how can we not live you know not live like we are criminals like how can we learn how to live and and, and invest in and 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 all of us and to be able to be to be able to be, you know, um, leaders and city council members, and um, how can we train each other and have a, you know, a a, 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 a TGNC task force, policy task force, where we can see here and where we can implement the laws and and have I say so and and policies and things of that nature when things are being written into law, so that you all know not to write not to write us out. How can we have a space that we, as Black transgender women, we can be a chair to navigate our experiences in life? I yield back my time. Yeah, no, you're spot on right. And I'm so glad you brought it up. And um, um, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Actually, um, after Laylene uh, was murdered, we set up a task force to look at the, the practices of DOC and understand what we can do to um, stop this from happening uh, in our city jails. And one thing we did in writing the law to create the task force was write it in such a way so the TGNC um, non-binary population was were the majority in the number of members of the task force. And we really wanted um, lived experience and advocacy driving the findings. And you are just so spot on right to bring it up. We have to do this over and over again. People just don't really understand um, so thank you for that. I see two other hands raised. Um, Council Member, uh, Chair Rosenthal, uh, we still have two more panelists uh, on the last panel and they're the ones with their hands raised, perhaps. Okay. So if there are any other council member questions for, the, for this panel. I just please. want to let then Brian Alicata, who I think uh, had something that he wanted to say. We have done. I just really wanted to briefly say that I have been sitting on the TGNC non-binary and intersex task force for the Department of Corrections. Um, and the report should be coming out soon. Fingers crossed, COVID kind of got in the way. Um, but it's Great. been a really trying experience over the past year um, to get DOC to understand that Unfortunately, when it comes to people in law enforcement, sometimes things have to be written out in long form. Just mm. making an example about one person doesn't make the same connection as a person in my body or in somebody else's body. And literally we've been having to sit there, go sentence by sentence and say, and like give examples of how this is not okay for trans women, for trans men, for non-binary people. And it's been a very trying and mentally taxing experience, primar especially during COVID, to, um, to do that. And, you know, um, I so appreciate your being on the task force. I actually didn't realize that. And I appreciate your mentioning that the report will come out soon. And when it does so, we will be having another hearing uh, to review the findings of the report. So thank you for that PSA. I, I turn it back to you, Chloe, thank you. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, seeing no council member questions, we will turn to the next public panel of testimony, which will include Melissa Sontag Brodo, legal director from Decriminalized Sex Work, and Marika Platter. Uh, Ms. Brodo, you may begin when the sergeant gives you the cue. Time begins now. Hi, thank you so much. I want to echo everything that, you know, the, the appreciation to the council members and to this committee, women and gender equity. 
and to all my fellow advocates for the incredible work and the testimony today. I'll be very brief um, because you know so much has been covered. But um, I just wanted to pull together a couple of the threads that had been mentioned um, so beautifully by T.S. Candy, uh, by Jared, by Jillian, right about this this issue of um, how and why you know people are are end up in positions where they are vulnerable to exploitation and violence, and what we can do. Um, to support those individuals, right? And what the council can do, what our, what our state officials can do. And just something that T.S. That Candy, that you said, that we don't choose the streets. And I think um, that that was really so on point. Um, and, and I to echo that and, and to highlight something that, um, that has come up, but hasn't, hasn't quite been fleshed out is the issue of human trafficking and how so many survivors of human trafficking are impacted by the loitering for the purpose of engaging prostitution bill. Um, I am the legal director of, of decriminalized sex work and the co-director of the SOAR Institute here in New York. Before that, I was a senior staff attorney at the Sex Workers Project, where, where Andy now is, uh, for, for around nine years. And I represented individuals who were arrested for Penal Law 24037, Penal Law 230. And over and over, right, there is this consistent theme going, going back again to, to what um, Candy had said is, is that people generally don't choose the streets, right? That there, there are reasons that people are engaging um, or, or even not engaging in, in prostitution, right? People are profiled uh, for engaging in prostitution who are in particular neighborhoods that are heavily policed. And you know, it, it is so important to note that the people that are going to be arrested for Penal Law 24037 are people that are either at heightened risk of trafficking, right? People that are not choosing to be involved in prostitution or that not choosing to be um, working outdoors, outside, right? Which is inherently more dangerous uh, and places people in more vulnerable positions, especially in terms of police violence, uh, client violence, et cetera and also people that are profiled, right? And people who are uh, trans women of color and people in low income communities that are heavily policed. So just, you know, tying together that thread that this law targets people that are the most vulnerable for a variety of reasons, including human trafficking, right? Um, I'm expired. Thank you so much. You have so much experience. Was there something else you wanted to add? I think that's just that piece. And, and, and to, I guess to go back to how we can help support people is it, it's really difficult because it's going back to why are people in vulnerable, vulnerable positions in the first place, right? Um, and, and these measures are wonderful, but we're not addressing sort of the root, the root problems. Um, but I, I thank everybody for, for being open to seeing how we can. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Marika Platter. Time begins now. Uh, it appears that Marika Platter is no longer with us in Zoom. If I have inadvertently missed anyone who wishes to testify, please use the raised hand function in Zoom now. Seeing no one, I will turn it back to Council Member Rosenthal, uh, Chair Rosenthal for questions. No questions. I think uh, it's time to close out this hearing. And I just, you know, want to extend my gratitude to everyone for your patience for staying this long, but um, for everyone who testified uh, for bringing your truth to this hearing, uh, your honesty, your, you are the ones who are making the difference. And you're the ones who are going to make this change in law. 
so that everyone can have a normal experience walking outside without being targeted. Um, thank you so much for your time. I, I also really want to double down on gratitude to everyone who made this hearing possible, the staff, uh, the sergeants in arms, uh, Chloe, great moderation job. It's a lot of work. I know that. Um, thank you, Council Member Ayala for staying on to the end. And um, I hope everyone stays safe and, and takes really good care. Um, this is a really, this is really tough. So thank you, thank you for sharing your truth. Bye everyone. Oh, the hearing is now closed. <laughs>